This is episode number eight with Danielle Laporte. The Show. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, the habits mindsets, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Danielle is the author of The Fire Starter Sessions and The Desire Map, a guide to creating goals with soul. Her next book, White Hot Truth, launches in May 2017, which I'm super excited about. She is also a speaker with soul and a heart-centered, passion-driven entrepreneur who believes the best self-help is self-compassion. I've been following Danielle's work for about six years now, and I love her. I've seen her speak twice and was mesmerized by her poetic tone and ability to capture and hold her her audience. I don't think anyone blinked whilst Danielle was serenading us with her words. In this interview today, we chat about what turns her on in life, how to be in your power, her spiritual practice and morning routine, who she thinks is the most successful person and what her definition of success is, sex, sexual energy and creative energy and how to harness that within yourself. We also talk about flow state and how sex is the most enlightened and least enlightened thing you can do. Now this was super interesting. We also spoke about how to know when it's time to exit a relationship, the importance of support and challenge in a relationship, the biggest thing she is working on within herself at the moment, plus so much more. Now head to melissaambrosini.com forward slash eight. There you will find the show notes and everything that we mention in the show right there, melissaambrosini.com forward slash eight. So I'm so excited for you guys to hear this interview with the one and only Danielle Laporte. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you for being here. I am so honored. Mm, thank you for having me. Before we dive in, can you tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? Oh, okay. I love these kind of questions. <laughs> uh, breakfast this morning was granola with some strawberries. Not my typical breakfast, but it's, it is snowing intensely here in Vancouver, which rarely happens. And I just felt I needed like extra cozy breakfast. So there's a long description of what and why. Yum. Sounds good. Sounds good. So today we're chatting about sex and success. And in your opinion, who is the most successful person you know personally or you know of? Hmm. Well, it depends how you define success. I would have to define that in my own terms, which has everything to do with like kindness and a prosperity that is, you know, has generosity built into it. Um, who would I say is successful? Um, well, I mean, there's an obviously Oprah Winfrey has built an empire based on really, a, you know, a sort of a wellness mission in terms of, you know, psychological wellness and making a difference. And uh, she's a great philanthropist. So there's a lot of admiration for me with her. I'm a huge fan of Eve Ensler, who's the founder of V-Day, who's, who is originally the creator of uh, Vagina Monologues. And V-Day is a nonprofit that exists to end violence against women and girls around the world. And I think, you know, Eve is a success not because of her entrepreneurial prowess, which is where so often our minds go in terms of success, um, but because she has really sort of punctured that creative space with a very political and personal and, you know, <laughs> on fire feminist message. And she's galvanized a lot of women to really own their truth and their abuse stories and their capacities for healing. And, and every year, every year they get 1 billion people, a billion people dancing on February 14th, you know, typically known as Valentine's day, um, in concert to end violence against women and girls. That is my idea of success. Beautiful. And so based on your definition, how would you rate yourself today, right now in this moment? 
Well, you know, this is a very salient question because I was just at this dinner party a couple weeks ago in New York with about 10 friends and it became the party conversation where I said, you know, do you think you, do you consider yourself successful? And this is a table of people who are raising venture capital, who have big online followings, you know, obviously successful by a lot of society standards. And when I, when the question, my own question came back to me, my answer was, yes, I currently feel successful because, uh, because I have mostly, mostly been kind along the way as I've built my business. I've made a few mistakes. Uh, I've had some, I've had some pointed moments where I could have softened it and I've had a few messy goodbyes, but vastly I have, I've, I've operated in integrity and, and everything came from that. So, you know, my mortgage isn't paid off and I want to give all of my 10 staff a fat raise and I'm going to give lots more money away. And I've only just begun, but I feel successful in my heart. Yes, absolutely. And that mostly part, that mostly, mostly part is, you know, what, is this something that you're constantly working on? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I feel like I am, a, I'm a naturally intrinsically loving being. I know that about myself. That is a truth that gets me through almost everything. Even when I have, even when I have to do something that doesn't look outwardly loving, you know, letting somebody go, firing someone killing a contract, the, you know, the person on the other end of the, you know, the receiving end of that isn't, isn't going to be walking away saying, Oh, she's such a loving person. And sometimes they are, it's like, well, you know, she couldn't have done that in a more kind way. Uh, so I think I am that, and I have to keep, I have to always be diligent that I am being my true self because, you know, it's easy to, it's, it's easy to slip sometimes. And, you know, I just had a moment the other day I was getting on a ferry and I missed the cutoff to get on the ferry by three minutes, three fucking minutes. And they, (laughs) they wouldn't, and the ferry's sitting right there. It's not like it's pulled away from the dock. And I know I can, yeah, I was going to say, did you jump? I could have run for, I mean, we could have made it. And I, I was like, not an awesome woman in that moment. Cause, because, you know, the worst thing to say to me is policy. Oh, this is our policy. And, you know, because I just want to blast through that with common sense and human connection and some like dignity of free will <laughs> to make an empowered decision. And I would, I was probably the girl on the other end probably did not think I was kind. And I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't mean, but I was pissed off. So uh, but mostly, uh, mostly dealing with me, you, you were dealing with a, um, a loving, considerate, uh, know what I want, very respectful of what you need at the time, human being. Yeah. You really feel that in, in everything that you do. So that's radiating out, which is mm. beautiful. Thank you. I would love to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is sex and how that ties into being successful. So a lot of women listening to this podcast may find sex taboo, but in my opinion, I feel like understanding this powerful primal part of ourselves is essential for our success in all areas of our life. And it wasn't until I met my husband that this all started to make a lot more sense for Mm -hmm. me. So, you know, I'd love your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so much of our creativity is intertwined, not rooted, but intertwined uh, with our sexuality. Um, So much of our identity in the world is intertwined with our sexuality. And when you combine creativity with identity, I mean, you should have something that looks like a career or your vocation or your life calling, or at the very least your job. And so if that's true, which I think it is, uh, then you really want to be clear in terms of your sexual wellness, your sexuality, wellness, your, you know, what turns you on in life. And, uh, you know, so there's so much freedom there and so much creativity there. 
yeah. So I'm, I'm down with that, with the relationship of, of sexuality, not necessarily sex. They're, they're related obviously, but they're different things. Uh, your sexuality and, and your creative output. Why do you think it is so taboo and why do we kind of like shy away from it when, you know, for me, it feels like it is, it is a, such a, an sexual, ex, uh, it is such a creative expression, you know, sex for me is very creative and that energy, um, you know, that flows through you. Mm. Why do you think it is we're so, uh, we shy away from it and it's so taboo in today's society? Well, I think, uh, there's two answers to this. One is the, the, the taboo-ness of it has to do with power and oppression, suppression, repression. Uh, if you can wrest away control of someone's sexuality, of their sexual behavior, you really effectively run their life. And, you know, this is something, this is a through line of all organized religion and the patriarchal paradigm that's been going on for thousands of years. To control someone's sexuality and their sex, whether it's their orientation, their sexual expression, their reproductive rights, uh, all of that, uh, it's powerful, it's charged, and it's kept under wraps for, that, for lots of those reasons, for those disempowerment reasons. So that's part of the taboo. You know, the, the other aspect of this is, you know, what you call shy... And, and I would I would throw another word into the mix, which is sacred. There's a reason. There's a really good higher consciousness, elevated reason to be, you know, so-called shy and uh, respectful about sex, and to not flaunt it, and to not openly discuss it, and to keep it where it should be, which is in a sacred, privately held space. And I think we're out of balance on both of those things. So we're out of balance with the oppression and the suppression, and we're out of balance with uh, the respect and the, and the sacredness of it. So uh, it's not easy to talk about for all the empowerment reasons, and it shouldn't always be talked about for all of the sacred reasons. Mm, I love that. You know, it's very easy to, you know, get naked and have sex with someone, but to stand naked and bare your soul and really love make and stare into someone's eyes and really connect on that deeper level is a completely different creative, sacred experience. Um, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, there's no, who, who, who would disagree with that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. intimacy, there's, there's many, and intimacy runs on a spectrum many layers. I mean, I'm most interested in the depths of it. And, um, and I think it's really important to like insert in the, in the conversation around sex and work that it's really, it's sexuality and work. So there's, there's lots of people who might be listening to this, who might not be sexually active. They may be taking a sex hiatus they may have an awesome sex life. They may have a distorted sex life. You don't necessarily have to be getting laid in the deepest, most intimate way to have an unleashed and liberated and full sexuality that you can be bringing to your, your creativity and to your work. Yeah. So what are some other ways? Like, what are some other ways that people can, if, if we're not making that deep love with someone else what are some other ways we can tap into that mm -hmm. well I think it's like really it's about being clear on what turns you on in life and, yeah. and it has a lot you know there's there's that and there's your you know your sensual relationship with you have with that you have with everything from you know how you make contact with strangers and the, you know the guy who gives you your your cappuccino in the cafe and just like being a loving generous being like you know sexuality is something that really needs to be fluid like frozen sexuality <sighs> it you know so much doesn't go right when you're when you don't have that fluidity of expression which has so much to do with love and it being heart centric not just you know second chakra centric and, and just being able to be excited by what's around you, whether, you know, it's snow or the taste of food or 
how, how you engage with your team, how you're in your power, how you're in your sexiness. And finding what, what, what turns you on, you know, what are the things that turn you on in life? Oh, there's so, so much like, you know, sexy just as a word, as a concept, as a practice is, you know, it's a, it's a big part of my vocabulary. I think, oh, this is where I wanted to go. The, you know, the other part of this being aware of what turns you on is also feeling like you are in your power as much as you possibly can be in your power. Because when you're fully in your power as a creature, whether you identify as someone who's feminine centric or masculine centric, there is nothing sexier than feeling you have a voice and you affect a situation, you know, having an effect on a situation, whether it's a conversation or it's a policy or it's a meeting or it's some, you know, someone reading your, your, your blog for the day. I mean, that is you being creative. That is you taking your energy, packaging it in a certain way, putting it in a form and it moving someone that is creative for me personally. That's a very sexy feeling. So I mean, mostly for myself, I feel sexy the majority of the time because I am really aware of how I can affect change and, and how turned I am on, I am to be creative and creativity for me means a lot of things. It's, it's how I welcome someone into my home. It's how I dress. It is very obviously how I write and the message messages that I put into my writing, you know, it's it's very sexy for me to be able to use my social media power to say what I thought needed to be said politically and culturally for, you know, stopping the Dakota pipeline happening in the United States. It's, it's very sexy for me to be able to give my opinion about positive parenting or engaged entrepreneurship or how, or overconsumption. It's just, I'm really turned on by being opinionated. (laughs) Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, you've really got to be in your body to embody that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would love to chat about flow for a second, because personally, when my husband and I aren't, you know, making love, I feel like there's less flow between us or to some extent, you know, less flow in my life. Um, and I, and I often wonder, should I be able to maintain that state of flow without making love to my husband? And this is something that I really like, this is something that I struggle with. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this because I think, you know, I should be able to be in that flow state on my own. Um, but I believe, you know, that lovemaking is the cement. It's the glue that binds us together. And I'm interested to hear your perspective on this for people who are in a relationship and also for those people who aren't and, and your perspective on that flow within a couple. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, this, this goes, this is a very tantric question, right? So, I mean, one, one school of thought is that Sexual expression, engaging in a sexual act is actually a huge distraction to enlightenment. Okay, so just let's park that. The other school of thought is that sexual engagement is the doorway to enlightenment and you can't get there without Mm. it. And both are really problematic. Um, You've got to choose the road that works for you. I don't think this can be you know, it can turn into dogma, right? So, you know, thinking that you need to be in the flow or that sexual engagement is the way to higher consciousness is problematic because it requires another person, doesn't it? Yes. And, um, a, that might not be the path that your soul is on right now. B, I have, I personally have a problem with that route because I want to be able to reach higher consciousness no matter what no matter who's in my life, no matter the weather, no matter my financial situation, I cannot let my enlightenment, my evolution rely on anybody else, not my guru, not my lover, nobody. Uh, so that's, that's my perspective on that. The other side of the equation 
or the other, the other perspective that, you know, sex is a distraction from enlightenment. There's two answers to that. Yes. And no, I mean, if you're engaging in low vibration stuff, you know, you could just equate, you just say, look, are you doing junk food sex or are you doing organic, really thoughtful eating when it comes to your sex life? So not all sex is equal. Uh, so there's that. Yeah. I mean, it's complicated. You see, I've I've given you eight answers, (laughs) eight different answers for one question. No, that's great. I love that junk food sex or organic, you know, really nourishing sex. It's a really good question for everyone to kind of ponder and sit with, you know, what type of sex am I having at the moment? Is it the junk food or is it the nourishing? It's a really, really good question. Um, I'd love to switch gears a tiny bit. I, I believe every relationship serves a divine purpose. And for me, I have known with my past relationships that they had would always come to an end and whether that was after three weeks or three months or three years. Mm. But with my husband, it, it feels very different and um, otherwise I wouldn't have married him and I just knew, you know, as, as cliche as it sounds, you know, when you know, you know, like and people had said that to me, but in all of my past relationships I always knew that it was there just to serve a purpose And I see a lot of women really struggle with this, not knowing when the relationship has served its purpose Mm -hmm. and when it's time to consciously uncouple, so to speak. I would love to hear your advice for people in that situation. Like how can they, how can they know within themselves whether it's time uh, to move forward, uncouple, or whether there's still some stuff there to learn? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, well, I, I do believe you have to earn your way out of the relationship. And it doesn't mean that it needs to take a long time to earn your way out. You just need to be clean in how you're getting out. I, you know, in the relationships I've left, I really tried everything. But like, that's my personality. I also, you know, I learned a lot about over trying and overgiving and being, you know, foolishly compassionate and excessively tolerant. You know, these are all really typical behaviors for women who consider themselves to be on a spiritual path because we often mistake spirituality for excessive tolerance. And we, we just take a lot of shit. So uh, uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, maybe the most enlightened evolved thing for you to do is just change the locks and it's over. (laughs) Like there's no, (laughs) there's not a lot of processing that needs to happen. You just have your awakened moment and it's done. Um, I really think, you know, it's, it's, there's like, I, I can tell you for sure, there's no formula and it's different for everybody. I think when you can't, when you're staying out of a sense of obligation, it's over. Mm. It's over. And at least that, I, that would be, that would be for me. You're saying, cause you don't want to hurt the other person or it's just for the children. Um, or you made it, you know, so many of us make vows and make promises. We support people financially. We get up at the altar and we say, I do, we commit, we engage, you know, uh, if you're doing it because of a vow based in the past, tough, tough. And yeah, it's so personal. I mean, I think a lot of us quit sooner than we should. And a lot of us hang in way too long. Mm, I just got full goosebumps because I have a friend who stayed for 17 years Mm. too long. She knew for 17 years. Mm. And I was just like, my heart just expanded for her. Like I just, oh, I just wanted to hold her when she told me this. And she was married for about 26 years, I think it was. And yeah, there, there, you're right. There is no formula, but if you're staying out of that sense of obligation, then yeah, that's, that's a surefire sign that maybe something needs to shift. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I think it's important to blow the illusion that finding your soulmate means that life will be easier or perfect. And in many ways, my marriage is the most challenging relationship I've ever had. And that's because there's nowhere to hide. However, with that challenge also comes its opposite, which is support. I think for many, the question is, how do you know when challenge is supportive or when challenge is disrupt, disruptive, disruptive, sorry. Mm-hmm. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, it's, it's something that I love chatting about. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it has to do with expansion or constriction or oppression, I would say. Like, you know, you accept the challenge, whether it's to be more intimate, to be more disciplined, to be more liberated, whatever it is. And on the other side of it, you feel expanded and you feel more powerful and you feel more like yourself, even though it was hell getting there, but you're just, there's some gratitude like, Oh, I'm better. I'm glad I did that. Then there's the challenges that you accept and you don't feel more like yourself, you know, and, and it can be really tricky, especially in this, this holistic space and especially around the conversation around sexuality and liberation you know you could accept the challenge to have an open relationship because that looks liberated or to get you know really try on your kink or whatever it is and you actually don't feel more like yourself you feel a little foggier a little heavier a little dirty a little uh those are not great challenges so it's it's got to feel light and expansive or or it's not good for you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love, I, I think there's always got to be that little bit of a balance between support and challenge. Um, and and when, it's, when it's mainly supporting your growth, and of course there's going to be times where it feels challenging, but when it's mainly supporting your growth and there's that rise, then it, it's a good indication that, you know, that balance of support and challenge, that polarity is 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 there and it's good. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear what is one thing you're working on or would like to improve within yourself at the moment that you wouldn't necessarily want anyone to know. Can you share anything with us? No, (laughs) (laughs) I don't want anybody to know. I'm not going to talk about it in an interview. (laughs) Come on. Or anything that you're working on that, yeah, that you can share. Well, right now it has a lot to do with Pleasure and service, you know, like these are really, I think everybody's really aware of the intensity of these times, whether you're feeling the pain of, you know, bombings happening in Syria and an immigration crisis or global warming or what's happening with the divisiveness of the U.S. election. I mean, there's just any day, just get up and check your Instagram feed if you follow the news channels. And there's lots of reasons to feel despair. And the way I'm wired and my life commitment this time around is to really use my skills and my talents to be of service. And I've been feeling, uh, you know, there's a lot of heaviness lately. And I was having a massage last week. And as I'm having a massage in my nice fancy spa with my friend in the next room, all I can think about is all the people who are trying to pro- who are who are in the snow, in teepees, in Dakota, protesting this pipeline so that there isn't an oil spill that ruins you know the water for millions multi- millions of people. And I thought, you know, me feeling guilty for the pleasure I'm having today in relationship to the people who are protesting on the front lines is actually not doing anybody any good. And <clears throat> you know, I have a, I have a very deep and consistent spiritual practice in my life that like takes time out of my life and requires some real discipline. And I need to make sure that in all of my work and my discipline stuff, and how are we going to give more money away? And how can I write more? How can I do more? How can I always do more? That A, I'm taking my pleasure and B, I'm doing it without guilt. It's more important than ever when you are committed to, to bringing the light to the dark um, you know, that you move towards the joy at the same time. And so that's my practice. That's my practice now. Just, uh, move towards the joy and 
that will have me be of greater service. Yeah. That's a really good point that you just made. And it's something that I haven't really stopped to consider within myself. You know, I'm very good at taking time out for my spiritual practice and to fill myself up, but I do it with a tiny pang of guilt, Mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, how dare you, you know, take this time out when this is happening in the world. Um, So thank you for reminding me that my role, that's, that, that is not doing a service to anyone and that my role is to do it without the guilt. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, like you said, um, do you engage, uh, in it? Like, do you actively go out and read and, you know, become aware of everything? Or is that something that you kind of don't really want to tap into because, you know, of that, of that energy or, or, or do you kind of engage in it? Not engage, mm-hmm. but do you kind of read about it? Mm-hmm. I'm in. I, I, you know, part of my being, part of my spiritual practice is being informed. Um, yeah, I used to disengage, <laughs> extremely disengaged in, in the news. And now I'm not. And I do so in a way that I think is as conscious as I, as I can be which is I don't believe everything I read or hear or see. And, but I want to know what's going on uh, socially and politically and like what do people think is the truth. And if I can affect an issue, use my platform to do that, I will do that forever. Beautiful. And have you always been like that or, or were in the past where you're a little bit more like I'm not going to no. tap into no, that? No, I've never been shy to say what I wanted to say and use my platform for, for any kind of agenda. I'm really, I'm, I'm really down with having an agenda and pushing that. Um, have I always been as interested in what's happening? No, I have not, but it's, it's getting a little late in the cosmic day (laughs) to not be aware (laughs) of the pain that other people are in. So I'm, Mm. I'm going to face it. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Let's pretend you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the curriculum in every single high school around the world. Now, of course, your book's already in there. So this is uh, (laughs) not including your books. Um, What is one book that you would choose to go in the high school curriculum in every high school around the world? Oh, wow. God, that's intense. (laughs) you know i would have to say i think the four agreements oh yeah yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. um you know speaking of wands your word is your wand uh do your best and i forget the other two but they're great (laughs) Um, (laughs) i remember they were awesome (laughs) Yeah, they were awesome. But I mean, if, if people got that, and I think there's a book yet to be written, which is a really simple primer on what self-love looks like and how self-love flowers out into becoming social service. Uh, yeah, I need to write that book. Maybe I'll do that. Yes, please. Can you? <laughs> so speaking of before we were chatting about Uh, your spiritual practice, I would love to hear about, you know, your morning routine or your spiritual practice, how you prime yourself Mm -hmm. for the day. Well, it varies and it's not, so it's, it's it's not always the same, but, but for the last while, uh, I have a very steady practice. So the first thing I do in the morning is meditate and it's, it's quite disciplined. Sometimes it's more disciplined than I want it to be, but I've made a, I made that commitment. And it, do you practice I, uh, transcendental or um, no, it, a particular uh, type? I work with different mantras at different times for different amounts of time for different reasons. And so that's part of my practice as is prayer. And there's a lot of light work. Um, you know, and then I'm <laughs> first thing I do really, really the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I check my phone. And every time I check my phone, first thing I go, ah, 
I really wish I didn't check my phone first thing, but I do. And then I set it aside and then I turn on whatever meditation I'm going to do or if I'm doing a mantra. Um, sometimes it's silent and sometimes I, I need my, I need my playlist. And, and then there's also, then like I have my whole health regime. So some days that means going to the community center and rowing, just on a rowing machine and elliptical and sweating or it's spin class. And some days it's like nothing. <laughs> it's pretty balanced. I'm actually, it's, you know, it's 50, 50, uh, I'll walk around the lake and I have a son. So most mornings it means, <laughs> uh, dancing in the kitchen and getting some kind of breakfast happening. And I walk him to school and usually there's a lot of laughs in my house in the morning. It's, it's pretty great. It sounds beautiful. Um, I'd love to hear three things you're most recently grateful for in your life. It's always people. It's always people. Uh, I'm really grateful for my new publicist, which sounds, which sounds so Hollywood and self-serving, but I mean, really, she's just this angel in my life who really gets who I am. And next year will be a really big year for me. And, and it's really time, like, you know, for, for someone in my business as an, as an author and a speaker, finding the right publicist to work with you is, it's like finding the right Olympic coach. And so I feel really blessed by, by her. Her name is Heidi. And I'm really grateful for, oh, it's always people, always my girlfriends. You know, at this particular time, we're all in a really similar boat. Uh, for one reason or another, we're all just like really overworked and it's like everybody's crazy busy time right now. And when we just make time for each other, it's like nectar. We're so happy to be together. And I'm infinitely always perpetually grateful for the light. Just, you know, everybody would have their own word for it, but for God consciousness and for higher guidance and for the fabric that keeps things moving forward in the right direction. And, and, you know, for how blessed I am to, you know, I can open myself up to that and, and have that light come into my life in the form of creativity and to, to be of more service and, and it affects everything. I mean, I'm funnier, sexier, better mom. I'm a better person because of my relationship to to light. Beautiful. I'd love to hear now, what is, in your opinion, one of the most important things that you could do for your health? Mm. Well, other than meditate, uh, which affects everything, everything, everything all the time. Other than that, everything has to do with your, as a woman, uh, adrenals and digestion and your liver. There's so much, it's all your organs. <laughs> But if you were taking care of, if, if, if you hit, in, if you hit adrenal fatigue, you're fucked. Basically it just, a, adrenals affect everything. And cortisol has everything to do with your adrenals. And then stress has everything to do with cortisol. So let me just simplify that answer and say, get eight hours of sleep a night, seven to eight hours. And you're halfway there. Your body can take care mm. of so much when you are properly rested. And it sounds so trivial, but it isn't. It's fundamental. Yeah. Is adrenal fatigue something that you've experienced? Uh -huh. Absolutely. And it's, mm. it, it, it just affects everything. Your mental clarity, your weight, your skin, how shiny your hair is. And you get your adrenals dialed in, you, everything is way better. And that the first thing any doctor will tell you, whether in functional medicine or traditional medicine or naturopath, it's about sleep. I changed my relationship mm. to sleep. My life changed. Yeah, beautiful. And what is one of the most important things that you could do for your wealth, which is, you know, I, I refer to wealth as is what you do in the world and your career and what's something that one of the most important things that you could do for that? Well, inner and outer. So inner is you have to believe you deserve it. If you don't believe you deserve it, you are, you're blocking your own desires. And the other is you better have a good bookkeeper. So <laughs> yeah, it was one of the first really smart things I did. I got a bookkeeper 
you know, a dozen years ago before I thought I could afford one. I thought, well, I'll just learn Excel and do it all myself. And yeah, get somebody to get your numbers in order. And you've got to, you've got to lay that foundation for yourself. Yeah. I agree. And finally, what is one of the most important things that you could do for love, for your relationships, you know, self-love or, or your other relationships with others? Well, I'll tell you one of the most important things I do for my self-love and for my relationship with others uh, is solitude. <laughs> so, it, you know, I am, this doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody is wired this way, but the time I have by myself to, to practice, to just hear my own thoughts, to dance in the kitchen, to like clean up my act, to just like get my stuff in order. It it makes all the difference. So when I'm with someone, I'm really with someone. When I'm asked about what I think, I really know what I think. And I I think that's solitude. uh, My time alone really helps me be a truly engaged listener. I think listening is one of my superpowers. And that is mm, pretty fundamental. <laughs> if not, you know, it's, it's, I, it's definitely essential, if not fundamental, to any kind of loving relationship, the capacity to really listen and hear what someone is saying and what they're not saying. Mm, beautiful something that I'm consciously working on every single day Mm. I want to become a world-class listener Mm. and really listen to I want to you know listen in between the words Mm. exactly what you said what they're saying and what they're not saying so Mm. yeah thank you for that reminder and thank you for for being here for sharing all of this beautiful love and wisdom. I want to acknowledge you for all the work that you do in the world. I have been following your work for about six years now and I I love everything that you put out and the energy that is behind it. Most importantly, it, you can really feel the love. So I'm very grateful that I stumbled across your work um, and I'm also really excited that you are heading to Australia in February 2017 and all the beautiful goddesses in Australia get to soak up some of your wisdom. So I'll put all of the details for that in the show notes that everyone can check out and come and meet you. I'm, are you excited about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's a journey and it's, it's worth the journey. Yeah. And I love working with John Owen and his team and Claire at the Wake Up Project. They're just like, oh, lovely people. So, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, they are angels. They're such beautiful, beautiful people. So um, I will, yeah, put all of the details in the show notes. Thank you so much again. It's been such a pleasure to chat to you and to soak up all of your wisdom and you've sparked a lot of things within me. So I'm really grateful and honored and I just wanted to say thank you again. Mm, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the fun questions. This was, this was, uh, it was deep and it was light. So thank you. Pleasure. Take care. I loved chatting with Danielle. I could have just spoken to her for so long. I'm really going to work on my listening. And another thing I'm really going to be conscious of is not feeling guilty when I'm filling myself up because that is not serving anyone. I'm great with self-love and self-care and I do it daily, but there are times where I too feel a little bit guilty. So this is something that I'm going to consciously work on. That's one of my little takeaways from this interview. So if you liked this interview, please subscribe and leave me a five-star review because that means we can inspire more people together. And don't forget to tell me on Twitter who you would like me to interview and make sure you tag me. My handle is at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that we mentioned in the podcast, check out the show notes. You can do that at melissaambrosini.com forward slash eight. And you can check out all of my other podcasts there as well. You just have to head to melissaambrosini.com forward slash podcast. So thank you so much for being here and for wanting to be the best version of yourself and for showing up for you. 
you seriously rock. Now, if there's someone in your life that you think would really benefit from this episode, please share it with them right now. And until next time, don't forget, love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.